I just say, um, and I don't know, because I don't know if Robert will say this, but he's the chair of IGPAC, which is the Intergovernmental um, Policy Advisory Committee, which is one of the USTR um, advisory committees, and I serve on that. Rep it represents state and local interests. So I just thought I'd just mention that, and I, I've worked with him ever since I've gotten on to that, which was, I think, back in 2011 that I was appointed to that. So um, he, he both works on Washington issues, but also nationally, you know, he kind of represents state and local interests um, to the U.S. Trade Representative. So. Thanks so much. Well, I'll thank you for asking me to, to brief you. I've been asked to, to give you a briefing on the WTO dispute settlement case involving a U.S. Uh, uh, state-level renewable energy programs, and uh, this case is important not just because of the industry sector involved, but also because it's competing with uh, the EU case against U.S. federal and state subsidies for Boeing to be the first WTO case to go all the way through the dispute settlement system that involves uh, a state measure. So let's go to page two, Locke. So here, here's just a brief uh, outline of the, the timeline on the case. Uh, it's widely acknowledged that uh, India asked for consultations about the state programs in retaliation for a WTO case brought by the U.S. against India's own renewable uh, energy programs, which the United States ultimately won. Um, so the consultations are the first step in, in the WTO dispute settlement system. If the con consultations fail to, you know, uh, find a resolution, then Within 60, day, uh, 60 days after that, the, the party can ask the WTO to um, establish a, a panel to rule on whether the measures at que in question violate WTO rules. Um, you can see what the, the, the panel report was published in June. We'll get to that in a second. And in August 2019, both the India, India and the United States um, asked for a pellet ruling uh, on the case. I will get to that in a moment. Turning to page three, I've listed the uh, challenged uh, state programs, uh, anywhere from Washington, Montana, Connecticut, and so on. Next page. So I can't go into all these uh, programs, just talk about a little bit about a couple of them uh, uh, as examples. So in Washington State, we have the Renewable Energy Cost Recovery Incentive Program. So what happens is that uh, purchasers of renewable energy systems um, receive a, uh, a rebate for this and incentive payments from the utilities, and in return, utilities get a uh, utility tax credit so that they're made whole by this. And, Otherwise, they would have objected to the program. So the incentive is higher if the solar module or inverter or other renewable product is uh, purchased in, is, is produced in Washington in state. Montana has a tax incentive for ethanol production. Again, it's based on if the ethanol and the, uh, is produced in Montana from Montana-grown agricultural products. In Minnesota, there's a program where your residents get rebates uh, if they purchased and installed made in Minnesota, Minnesota solar thermal systems. So I can't go through all these programs, but you can see that there's there's one thing that they have in com common, whether it's you know a rebate or a tax break, it's it's uh, either given to or it's higher for uh, products purchased uh, if they're made in, in that state. And those are extra incentives which the far, foreign product would not receive. Next page. So um, here we're going to talk about uh, India's main challenges. First one, the most significant one, is uh, under the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, uh, which covers trade and goods. Article 3.4 basically says, while you can allow countries, it allows countries to discriminate at the border in terms of, you know, placing tariffs on products. Once the product is in that territory, 
you, they cannot be discriminated against in terms of the laws, regulations, or other requirements. And the general purpose of uh, this article is, the, is, as you see it from WTR rulings, is to uh, maintain the equality of competitive uh, conditions for the imported uh, product versus domestic product. The actual trade effects, the, the, the level of, 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 of discrimination is, is not an issue. It's just if there's not equal competitive conditions, then you have a violation of Article 3.4 of the GATT. So basically, uh, to, to make a ruling on, on Article 3.4, there's three questions. Um, are the imported and domestic products at issue like products? Basically, are they similar competitive products? Two, is the measure involved uh, a law, a regulation, a requirement? Effect, affecting internal sale, offering for sale, purchase, transportation, or distribution or use of the product. And finally, whether that imported products are accorded less favorable treatment than like domestic products. And I got went in a little bit of detail here because the United States did not contest any of these arguments by India. And the problem here, as I mentioned earlier, is that uh, the U.S. brought a, a case against India that raised the very same questions about India's program. So U.S. Chair did not feel like it um, uh, had any grounds to really uh, – the, the facts were not at issue. The legal arguments were pretty, pretty obvious, so they did not contest these. So turning to the next page, there were other um, issues that uh, India raised. One was uh, under the Trade Related Investment Measures Agreement, basically uh, that covers investment, uh, WTO agreement covering investment. So the basis says, well, if you violate, violate uh, Article uh, 3.4 of the GATT, well, you also have violated the WTO uh, investment agreement. And the third major argument was that uh, these were prohibited subsidies. Basically, you get a subsidy, in this case, um, contingent on the use of domestic over imported goods. Now, I'm not going to go into uh, – we'll go to the next page here, because although those are the three main arguments that India made, the um, – WTO panel ruled that all the state programs uh, uh, violated Article 3.4 of the GATT, and it used, uh, used judicial economy on the other two claims under the TRIMS and the subsidies agreement. So uh, where are we now? So both sides have appealed the ruling, and these are more on technical matters they appealed over what they call the terms of reference, um, what measures should be covered by the dispute. And this is, uh, involves the fact that some of these amended, uh, these measures were amended after India filed its case. So the appeal will be about those narrow issues. It's not going to be any appeal, appellate ruling will not change the overall finding that the WTO made that these uh, all these state measures are discriminated against imported goods uh, and favored domestic goods. But in terms of, okay, what happens next, ultimately when you have a WTO ruling, there's really no uh, pain on the losing party until you go through a process to determine um, the value of retaliatory sanctions that the winning party can impose on the losing party. And before that takes place, um, you have to go have the appellate body because both parties have appealed. But right now we don't have a timeline because of we have an impasse at the WTO appellate body because of the U.S. is objecting to naming new members to that uh, appellate body because we are unhappy with some of their rulings. 
in the past. So there's not a, enough members, won't be enough members on the appellate body in um, as of this, at the end of this uh, this year. So in terms of when this any future WTO rulings take place, we really do not know. So we don't know, for example, when you know all the state programs will face, re, you know, the, uh, India will be authorized to retaliate against the U.S. because of this ruling, and that will put pressure on on, on states to, um, uh, you know, amend their measures. So that's the quick overview. I wanted to leave time to address any questions about the, the process here, um, the background to this case. There's been uh, a, a lot of, uh, in the last uh, five, I would say almost a decade, there's been uh, a lot of attention by WTO members over uh, clean energy programs and not just uh, limit this, this case in hand. Great. Thank you very much. And questions from the committee? And Sharon Treep has a question. Yes, thanks, Robert, for that overview. I guess my question comes down to there's a bunch of legislators sitting on this panel, and as well as members of the executive branch departments. And we're sort of wondering, I guess, well, what's the practical implications of this? I mean, do, do these states now have to go out and change their policies? Or you're talking about there's this impasse. So does that mean like people can just kind of keep things as they are for now? Um, what, what's your, your take on that? Well, you know, well, from the WTO Boeing case, we're waiting a ruling on, uh, you know, the value of uh, tariffs that the EU can place on U.S. exports. They just got today that WTO announced that the U.S. can put uh, seven uh, tariffs on seven billion of, uh, uh, of imports from the EU because we won our case against EU subsidies for for uh, Airbus. So that's really when the, the pain threshold hits, you know, when all of a sudden India starts putting tariffs on our products and, um, you know, they'll put some tariffs on exports from the, uh, the, the state programs that are involved in this case, but usually they target these politically because of, you know, you want to go after majority minority, minority members, uh, states or districts to try and increase the pain threshold before, you know, so uh, to try and force that um, uh, the, the states or the, the countries to change their, their program. So because of, you know, the, you know, the breakdown that pelts us, we don't know when that pain threshold will hit. Now, we've talked internally how Washington State is going to respond to this, and we were thinking about, you know, talk to the legislature, you know, this session about what we want to do, but now it's, you know, they're really, India cannot retaliate um, until we, you know, if, until we have a, a ruling about you know, from the WTO. This might kick the can down the road until you really face some pressure. Now, I will say that this administration's approach um, has been a little bit different than I expected. Uh, now, you have under the Uruguay round implementing language that in the case of a WTO ruling against the state, uh, just like in the, in the federal law, that does not automatically preempt, you know, the state or federal measure. What the Uruguay around implementing language says is that USTR and the state will come up with a mutually agreeable solution to how to respond to an adverse ruling. And uh, bringing in the WTO Boeing complaint, we're, we're facing a big issue here in the state of Washington, but I talked to USTR, they made it clear that, you know, it's up to the state to figure out how to respond. They're not going to pressure us. Now, this might be a little bit different approach due to this administration's uh, um, emphasis on sovereignty at the national level. I think that, you know, I see their approach has been, they made it very clear that, you know, they, they, they will leave it up to the state and they will not pressure us on how to respond to um, the ruling against 
Boeing. Now, that could change with a new administration coming into place that this this dispute uh, the, on renewable energy goes down the line. But that's the, the first I want to give you the what we're hearing from USDR and the Boeing situation, as well as what the early group, uh, around language says. Now, the, the other thing here is, 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 is comparing the cases that I think ultimately the value of, of tariffs that India will be allowed to place on USX is just going to be very low. Some of these state programs were never used. Some of them have, uh, you know, uh, not been used since 2013. Uh, Washington State program is, is very small. So when when the WTO has to evaluate, um, you know, what the level of tariffs will be uh, on U.S. exports, it's probably going to be a pretty low number. And so that means that the pressure on states to change their their their, their laws will be less uh, than if there was, a, you know, a, you know, high uh, value of tariffs on U.S. exports. Hope that answers your question. Yes, I think so. So they, the U.S. and India haven't actually fought to a draw, right? Because probably the tariffs that the U.S. could impose would be greater because yeah. India's program and that's was worth the more. Process. I mean, going back, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, that these uh, state programs have been in the eyes of our, our trading partners for years. There was a, a WTO case that I think Japan and the EU brought against Ontario. You might remember this, Sharon. Yeah. And um, the U.S. was being urged to join the case. And it's a similar, you know, domestic preference, and in, in, uh, Ontario and Canada eventually lost. But at that time, there were reports in the press that because of this case that I looked at a sub-central program in Canada, our trading partners were also looking at state-level renewable energy programs. And in, in, in 2013, China actually launched an investigation of these programs, and they determined, in their view, that they were prohibited subsidies. But um, this, this, they were doing this in retaliation for uh, the U.S. Uh, dumping duties and, and countervailing subsidy duties on Chinese panel imports. No, so, so what China made that investigation, they didn't act on it. It didn't mean anything until you bring a WTO case. What China did was they went after and put duties on U.S. polysilicon exports, and they kind of uh, let this program slide by. But India picked up on this. And so when the U.S. challenged India, and, and the in talking to USTR at that, that time, they said, well, we're considering what to do here because we, we know that the U.S. has some vulnerability at its state-level programs. But ultimately, after an uh, interagency process, they decided to go ahead and bring the case against uh, India, knowing that, gee, in the future, we might face a WTO case against these state programs. So that's my take on what the, the, the federal uh, you know, U.S. Tower was thinking. Yes. Uh, Hi, Robert. Um, my name is Tom Knowlton. I'm an assistant AG. I have a question about the process, which is um, I see from the timeline that the panel was established in March of 2017 and the report was issued in 2019. Did, did the state of Washington or any other state have any opportunity to participate or offer any evidence or uh, do anything in terms of the proceedings? Uh, you know, it's, it's really a tale of two worlds here. Um, we provided information early on uh, to USTR. But in this case, uh, we did not um, see any of the draft submissions by uh, USTR. We didn't see any of the draft statements of USTR before hearings. This is in contrast to the WTO Boeing dispute. First, first you know, the, the economic states are a lot different. Uh, stakes are a lot different, number one. Uh, number two, uh, you know, basically 
the U.S. position was they they couldn't contest anything. They we, you know they they knew that we're going to lose. But um, in terms of the Boeing case, we looked at um, all their draft submissions. We looked at all their draft um, uh, statements at hearings. We traveled six, seven, you know, seven times to Geneva to be uh, attend the hearings, and they relied on us. It was a really, really good cooperation. I, I can't say enough about the attorneys at the general counsel's office. Now, the early round implementation, uh, implementation bill says that they're going to, the USTR has to consult with states uh, on throughout the dispute resolution process. They did not do this in the India case. And I've actually had several conversations with the lead attorney in this case, as well as um, Molly at USTR Sharon, saying this is, this is not the way these these disputes need to be handled in the future. I realize this wouldn't change the outcome in the case, but USTR needs to follow the Uruguay round language and do as good a job as they did with the Boeing case uh, on any future cases. I hope that makes sense. There's, there's a really good example and a really bad example. And in, in the case here, this was, they, they did not do a good job. All right, he's shaking his head. That did help. Uh, I also noticed not so much as a, a question as it doesn't really matter. Like India, I don't believe they're producing any airplanes, but they can go after Boeing or something unrelated to a place where they've been harmed just looking to get money if they're successful in a suit. Is that right? It, the uh, dispute resolution says you should retaliate in the same sector. But in practice, that doesn't happen. They can go. They usually go beyond that uh, and go after different sectors or uh, whatever is politically advantageous. Uh -huh. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I just go back to the the question uh, about the consultation with um, USTR. I, I've worked, been doing this for a long time, and um, you know, USTR has said, you know, on several occasions, you know. We're not going to judge what you're doing in the state, whether we think this is a stupid idea or a good idea. Uh, we'll give you advice, you know, what we think, whether it's WTO consistent or not. But um, ultimately, you know, if it gets a complaint, we'll do our best job, no matter what we think internally uh, about the, uh, your, your program, to defend it before the WTO. And that's, that's kind of been my experience with them. So... I, I've, I've talked to you, I've talked to USTR over the years about you know when I have state measures up here, whether it's uh, you know, procurement or subsidies, and it's not absolutely clear to me what is meant by the language. I'll call, uh, talk to USTR and get their input about you know what does this language in this agreement really mean? Here's our situation here. Um, you know, uh, is, are we exposed to any legal challenge and so on? So. I've maintained a, a you know an ongoing dialogue uh, with them over the years that you know it, it doesn't leak, leak out it's but it's just been a, a kind of a productive relationship to try and defend the state plus get a better understanding of you know the 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 the, the agreements. Okay. Yes, uh, Sean. Um, I wanted. To real quick to the retaliatory sanctions. So it sounds like um, if this goes through the appellate process, India could, for example, place retaliatory sanctions on something other than like clean energy products or something in a different sector. But can they also, I guess what I was wondering is if the retaliatory sanctions are state specific, like in this case, would they only be able to place retaliatory sanctions on products from the state or like exports from the state of Washington or is it like can it be uh, yeah they, they would yeah, they would go after say apples we, we export a lot of apples and then, you know, but that would cover those those tariffs would cover apple exports from Oregon or any other state if that answers your question yeah, yeah. Okay. Or, or, or Maine, right. let's have some more of our uh, trade of products uh, squashed from Maine now yeah and lock go ahead um, Robert, uh, 
it's not clear to me whether uh, this uh, these allegations from India were filed under um, an ISDS provision in the WTO. Um, there, and I, there's no ISDS provision in the WTO, and I don't know if we have a bilateral investment treaty with India, and that's. If we did, that's where we might find the ISDS provisions. But no, I've never heard of um, any ISDS uh, discussion with respect to um, uh, uh, these programs that India challenged under the, the various WTO agreements. Well, and I noticed that it seems that this process, the WTO process, in some ways is significantly different than an ISDS process. Um, one thing I noticed is that there is the right of appeal, which I believe is not present in the ISDS process. Is that is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Um, I guess I have another question too. Is um, how big is the panel, and who's represented on the panel? Uh, it's. I, I want to say there's. I know there's three on the appellate body, and I think there's three on the uh, panel, and there's a pool of them. Uh, the appellate body members are uh, uh, maybe a total of five, and they have to, you know, they, you know, figure out, uh, you know, pick three members to, to serve on that, that the relevant panels. And there's a bunch, bunch of re retirements or terms have ended, and that's why that, that whole system is breaking down, because the U.S. is is blocking the naming of new members to the uh, appellate body. Is, um, are the members of the panel drawn from the same group of, I guess, professionals as in the ISDS process? I have never heard of any overlap between the two. Because the ISDS is outside the WTO system. don't see any other questions, Mr. Hamilton, so thank you very much from everyone here for that update and your perspectives, and we have your slides, so that'll keep jogging our memory, and I guess we can get in touch if we have questions that we can't answer locally, so thanks thanks a lot for being with us today. Please do, and don't, be, don't hesitate to send me some uh, questions. Will do. Great. Well, goodbye from here. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Bye thank now. You. Bye.